It was one of the greatest unsolved murder mysteries in British criminal history. The killing of nanny Sandra Rivett and the disappearance of the prime suspect shocked high society and gripped the world. His name was Lord Lucan. Was the aristocracy having their dirty linen washed in public? The whole of London was looking for, looking for Lucky Lucan. Many theories have been put forward about what really happened the night he vanished. You have a member of the aristocracy who has family links to the royal family, who's a fugitive and who has disappeared, and it remains a mystery. Thirty years on, the file is still open at Scotland Yard. Hundreds of people claim they have seen him in countries all around the globe, but despite a worldwide search, he's never been found. Most people who knew him well called him lucky, really. But as it turned out, I don't know whether he was quite so lucky. Tonight we examine what happened to Lord Lucan. Did he commit suicide? Or did his influential and aristocratic friends whisk him abroad? For 30 years, he's been named as a killer. But was he? For the first time on television, Lucan's son speaks about his father and the murder that has haunted his life. And we show home videos of Lord Lucan with his wife and children, which have never been seen before. I, I certainly don't believe he struck the blows. I, I don't believe he asked anyone else to. And I don't even believe that the person who did strike the blows intended to. We reveal a vital clue which police have always kept secret and which may now help solve this brutal killing. And we talk to senior officers at Scotland Yard about the new inquiry using the latest DNA techniques and a computer image of what the fugitive Earl could look like, they hope to finally solve this infamous murder mystery. At 8.30 p.m. on the night of November the 7th, 1974, Lady Lucan, estranged wife of the peer Lord Lucan, was at home with her children and nanny. Lady Lucan was lying in bed with her older daughter, Frances, the other two children having been put to bed by Sandra earlier on. At about nine o'clock, Sandra asked Lady Lucan if she'd like a cup of tea and then went down into the basement carrying some dirty crockery in order to make that tea. As she went down the stairs, she was viciously attacked and murdered in the basement area. At about 9.15, Lady Lucan started to wonder where Sandra had got to. She started walking down the stairs. She called out for Sandra, but as she did so, she was viciously attacked from behind, being beaten about the head. She heard a voice saying, shut up, and felt two gloved fingers being thrust into her throat. She was then tried to engage him in conversation, and she was literally talking for her life. She managed to persuade uh, the assailant, who she says was Lord Lucan, to come back up the stairs with her. They then went upstairs to the bedroom. Whilst he was in the bathroom, getting some damp towels to clean her up, she saw her chance and made good her escape. She then ran along the road to the plumber's arms. She walked into the pub and she was covered in blood from head to foot. And as then the alarm was raised and the police were called. The sergeant and I decided that we would go direct into the forced entry into the building. I kicked the door in and we went in. Sergeant Baker then immediately rushed down to the basement because that was the first lowest point of entry in the breakfast room where he discovered a pool of blood. You could see the splatters of blood on the wall. We then discovered there was blood coming from a canvas sack. Sergeant Baker opened the top of the sack to which he found the lifeless body of Sandra Rivet. This was a, clearly a very violent, probably frenzied attack on this victim. A ferocious attack, particularly on the, the nanny down on this floor, but also on Lady Lucan as well up here. <laughs> The fact that these blood splashes were all over the place, it doesn't happen unless there's repetitive blows. In regard to the injuries to Lady Lucan, I was amazed actually that she survived the attack. She'd obviously sustained a series of heavy blows to the head, um, some of them cutting through the scalp right to her skull. 
may have been some confusion, obviously from the injuries that she had, about what had happened. But she was very clear about the attacker was her husband, Lord Lucan, and, and so he became the principal suspect. As Lady Lucan was rushed to hospital for emergency treatment, police officers swarmed over the crime scene. Lucan, desperate about his children, telephoned his mother, asking her to take them to safety. After Lucan's mother had collected the three children, PC Baddock accompanied them to her home and waited by the phone in case Lucan rang again. From about half past 11, I suppose, we just waited on the anticipation that, that he might phone. And sure enough, at half past 12, the phone rang. She answered it, and you just knew in yourself that it was uh, the mother talking to the son. And she said, well, if you want to speak to the police, you can speak to them now. Uh, and he said, no, I'd rather not. I'll, I'll be in contact with them first thing in the morning. Thirty years later, who knows? We'll just have to wait and see. For the police, it seemed like an open and shut case. A man who planned to kill his wife and ended up killing his children's nanny. As he was a peer of the realm and an honorable man, everyone expected Lord Lucan to simply turn up with his solicitor but it would be a long wait, and Lucan was about to become the world's most notorious missing person. Seventy-two hours after the Belgravia murder, people were still in shock that a lord had apparently brutally killed one woman and violently attacked another. Everyone was looking for Lord Lucan, but there was still no sign of the missing Earl. Then the police made a breakthrough. He had in fact borrowed a vehicle from a friend of his, Michael Stoop, which was a Ford Corsair. And that car was found some three days later in Norman Road at New Haven. Inside the boot, police found what appeared to be a weapon. An 18-inch piece of lead piping bound in adhesive tape, similar to the one found at the murder scene. Blood smears matching the blood groups of Sandra Rivet and Lady Lucan were found in the car. There was a fingerprint on the rearview mirror. Then came another piece of vital evidence, posted only 14 miles away from where the car was found. On the morning of Saturday the 9th, uh, Mr. William Shan Kidd reported to police that he'd received two letters written by Lord Lucan. There was a blood smear on one of them, and that the postmark was Uckfield. Mr. Shankid explained that Uckfield was where Ian and Susan Maxwell Scott, two close friends of Lord Lucan, had their home. After the murder, Lucan had driven down to Sussex to see his friends, the Maxwell Scots. Susan Maxwell Scott saw him outside her window around about 11.35 that night and she admitted him into the house where he sat down and was made comfortable with a cup of coffee. In his letters to his brother-in-law, Bill Shand Kidd, Lucan protested his innocence. His story was that he'd been passing his wife's home and seen through the window of the basement a struggle going on between an unknown man and his wife. He'd let himself into the house using his key to intervene in this fight, whereupon the assailant had apparently run out of the door into the street and that he feared that she was going to claim that he was the attacker or had hired the man to attack him. Quarter to one, one o'clock. She says that he left the house uh, and was apparently on his way to somewhere else, possibly London. Nobody actually knows what happened to him after that visit to Uckfield, and he was never seen again. Despite the intense publicity over the police hunt for Lucan, Susan Maxwell Scott says she did not see the press and inexplicably failed to come forward to tell the police about Lucan's late night visit. But she was not the only one of Lucan's friends who had failed to tell the full story. While police were appealing for information about Lucan's whereabouts, a group of his closest gambling friends 
met at casino owner John Aspinall's house the day after the murder. We heard about it that morning and we got together to find out <laughs> what had happened or if anybody knew anything and just generally to try and see what could be done. What I probably would have done was if he had appeared here is anything that he wished. Yes, you actually say if he had begged asylum from me, he would have got it. He would have got it. But Lucan's son put a different interpretation on press interviews with his father's friends. I think they liked playing, toying with the media in a, in a very, to be honest, a rather cynical fashion of sort of hinting away, oh, you know, have I, like John Aspel, have I fed him to the tigers or uh, have I hidden him away? If you're going to turn your friend over to the authorities, be it the law, you're no longer a person, in my view. Really, actually, at the time, in November 1974, I don't think any of them were going to go out on a limp room. But there is a temptation when one is on the edge of a, an incident like that to treat it as a glamorous escapade, a traditional British charade and all of that. And I think people did think that. But to the senior investigating officer, Roy Ranson, it was a serious matter. One of their young detectives remembers what it was like. Well, we all called ourselves Lucan for Lucans. <laughs> We were all working class boys. We lived in an era where if you were introduced to someone as an honourable or a titled gentleman, you automatically gave them deference. All the sirs would come out and the touching of the cap. And we used to fall over backwards to give them allowances because they were gentlemen. Which in a way, for this particular case, turned out to be a problem. And it's very difficult when you have that in your mind to suddenly turn them into people that you have to ask nasty questions of. It's very disconcerting for a policeman to knock on the door and some butler to come to the door and say, I'm sorry, should you, you go, really should go around the back. The investigating officer was in a real predicament. You see, Mr. Ransom knew that he had to get these people in Belgravia to talk to him. And they weren't doing so. One evening, Ransom did get what he thought was some credible information that uh, Lord Lucan was going to be in a particular house. We went round to this house and went up the steps, knocked at this beautiful, I remember it was a beautiful front door, beautiful house. And a butler came to the door and wearing a full butler's uniform and white gloves. And he said, well, I shouldn't really let you in. He said, well, we're going to come in anyways. Mr. Ransom did notice inside that there was a dinner party going on. But it didn't put him off and marched straight in and said he was going to search the place for Lord Lucan. The next morning, there was a queue of people at Gerald Road Police Station wanting to speak to him. We managed to get statements from people that were sending us around to the back door previously to that. Five days after the murder, Lucan had still failed to come forward. A warrant was issued for his arrest and police began a wider search to find him dead or alive. With all the attention centered on Lucan, Sandra Rivett's family were angry that her death was overshadowed by the fascination with the Lucan family and the aristocracy. One of her friends saw her the day before she died. It seems like Sandra has been totally forgotten in all this. And it's like a little line saying, oh, the nanny. Some years it hasn't even had a name mentioned. And I honestly feel that Sandra and her family really have not had the justice that they should have had. The emphasis has always been on Lucan, and I think that they have been forgotten about. As far as the media were concerned, the big story centered on Lucan, and there seemed no doubt that he was the murderer. Every crime reporter on that job knew from almost the word go that they were completely convinced that Lord Lucan was the a killer of Sandra Rivet. It was all dressed up in any official statements with phrases such as, we are anxious to speak to Lord Lucan, and you know, Lord Lucan could be of great assistance with our inquiries. But as soon as the cameras were off or the notebooks were put away, they would quite happily say, yep, Lord Lucan did it. But Lucan's son believes that police had jumped to their own conclusions. Almost everyone immediately concluded the man was guilty, and nobody in the newspapers seemed to be shy about saying as much. I think the police formed a very concrete view of what had happened and didn't really bother, to be honest, to investigate the case as thoroughly as they might have otherwise done. 
those of us that were part of this investigation, we all thought that Lord Luca would march through the door with a great legal team saying, I'm here. It would only be a matter of weeks. We never contemplated the fact that we would never get him. But who was the subject of this nationwide search? Lord Bingham became the seventh Earl of Lucan on the death of his father in January 1964. He came from a long line of landed gentry. His great-great-grandfather was the third Earl of Lucan who ordered the charge of the Light Brigade. John followed his father to Eton. 1946-51 to 51, I was at Eton and the name Lucan one did get, come across him on a number of occasions and he was a very popular, he was talked about Eton. It was a great club, you know, you made an enormous number of fr friends, like Lucky did. Wherever you went, if you'd been at Eton, somehow you would find somebody who was also at Eton and you had a, a sort of a string that was automatically attached. I met John about 1954, very good looking, we thought, all the girls. Couldn't have not seen him in a crowd. He was very obvious in a crowd. He loved speed, fast cars, always two-seaters, and usually with an open top. Wonderful fun. Lots of whizzing air. He was a constant and true friend. Once you were a friend of John's, he didn't forget about you. After national service in the Coldstream Guards and a spell at a merchant bank in the city, Lucan was nicknamed Lucky by his friends after one gambling win of £26,000, equivalent to more than £208,000 today. Flushed with success, he left his job to become a professional gambler. The Clermont Club, owned by his friend John Aspinall, was a natural home for this aristocratic gambler. The Claremont Club was certainly, a, well, it was a collection really of, of rogues, all of whom were charming, um, li lived sort of dashing lives, had, had um, the gambling element right in their blood. I think we were all rogues together, to be honest, and, but nice rogues, exciting rogues. They weren't n nine to five men. You always had fun. That was obviously the joy of thinking you were going to make, make a lot of money. Very few of us did make a lot of money. Staff at the Claremont Club remember those days. I was a dorm, and uh, we just parked the cars and got taxis. And, you know, I'd never seen any people like that before. And uh, it was a very exciting time. A typical day in the Claremont Club was the one we'd get there at about 12 o'clock, half past 12. Your friends would slowly gather. You'd never be bored, you'd never spend your time alone, and you would then have a delicious lunch. It all revolved around, really, uh, Mr. Aspinall. He was like the leader of the clan, you know. He was their inspiration, you know, sort of a clique, I suppose. Well, I met Lord Lucan when he, I was just starting, he arrived at the club, and uh, someone said, that's Lord Lucan, so he said, pleased to meet you. And then over, over time, I got to be quite friendly, and I would do odd jobs for him, you know. I'd clean his car sometimes, even more. I'd take him to the airport. His neighbour, Peter York, watched Lucan's upper-class lifestyle. He seemed such an archaic figure, and he was, I don't know, late thirties when I first saw him. Everything about him was completely caricature. He had slick back hair at a time when it was wildly unfashionable, and he had a moustache of a completely archaic kind of almost Crimean officer kind. You thought, what gives? It looked like a lord. If you want to see a lord, you look at Lord Lucan. He was an asset to the Mr. Aspinall, really, because people, especially Americans, anyone who's a lord, you know, that's, this is Lord Lucan sitting at the same table, you know. He was a very popular gambler. Everybody liked playing either with or against him. And he gambled in big numbers, i.e. thousands. And if he was sweeping at shimmy um, over and over again, it would, it would build up. But he was calm, very, very calm always. But they were, they were frightening sums of money. And although I rarely got involved, I did occasionally get swept up by the glamour of it all. I mean, that is the thing about Lucky. He just 
adored it. He, he was there all the time, almost every day. But for him, it was almost a, a, a job, really, in some ways. He hadn't got any foreground in terms of any kind of personal achievement or any kind of guiding light. You know, what, what did he aspire to do? Get through the day, gamble, make some money. I mean, it was a hand-to-mouth existence. I think he must have, when he went home at night, wondered whether he was achieving what he should have achieved or whether he got so entangled in his day-to-day -day life that he, he, you know, he got in the muddle. But, of course, he, he was mad about his children. That was, his, that was the big worry that he had in his life is that his gambling was leading him away from the main part of his life because he did have, apart from the gambling, this very, very strong feeling for his children. At first, his gambling lifestyle didn't seem to matter to his young wife, Veronica. She reveled in his aristocratic heritage. She became the Countess of Lucan just two months after they married, but his family and friends thought the couple were ill-matched. We were surprised at his choice, but we thought probably it was a case of um, his feeling sorry for her because she seemed a rather pathetic little person to us. I think she didn't have a lot of time for our sort of way of life. It was probably outside her knowledge. But that was, that's the way of it. When you in-laws, it's a bit of a um, dodgy business. You never know who you're going to get as an in-law. Despite the family's misgivings, the couple seemed happy enough. This family home footage shows the good times they had together and the young countess seemed to tolerate life as a gambler's wife. But behind the scenes, tensions were building. Gambling doesn't really go with, with women, except, I think, in sort of 007 films. When Veronica appeared, there was a sort of jealousy of, of Veronica taking our man away from us. All the time one had the feeling that inside she was not really, you know, very happy. After the birth of their third child, Lady Lucan was suffering from postnatal depression and her husband was gambling more and more. The marriage was on the rocks and the couple finally separated after 10 years in January 1973. Convinced that her mental instability was affecting the children, Lucan began an obsessive campaign to gain custody of their son and two daughters. When they separated, I had the job of taking the children from this flat and taking the children to school. Until uh, one day, um, Lady Lucan, she said, in future, she said, neither you nor Lord Lucan will take my children to school now. Bugger off, that was the exact words. So that was the end of the job. Veronica made life very difficult for access. She used to make very unkind telephone calls on things to him, saying, you know, we're, we're just the children, you, there's no need for you to see the children, we, all we need from you is your money. But cash was something that Lucan was becoming desperately short of. Despite Lucan's estate, which had substantial properties and income, his own debts to lawyers and gambling friends were out of control. In his obsession to gain custody of the children, he hired medical specialists who proved that his wife was an unfit mother. He even tried to buy his children from her with a loan of £100,000 from a rich family friend. The bubble was about to burst. As Lord Lucan's desperation to win custody of the children grew, he hired detectives to watch Lady Lucan and tape to their private and increasingly bitter telephone conversations. He sat in his car on a nightly vigil outside 46 Lower Belgrave Street. His friends and family became increasingly concerned about him. I'm afraid slowly over the period of time, um, he became a loser. He was chasing. I think he was chasing. Chasing the money. Uh, you cannot win chasing because you go further and further down. And he was getting into serious uh, financial trouble. And then his wife became such a, such a, a, a focus for him of agony and, and so totally unacceptable in his life that, he, you know, the, the bubble burst. The John who 
I knew from the 50s was not the same man who I was seeing early 70s. I mean, he did really desperately care about these children. And I think having thought about it, he then took this ghastly step and made a complete bog of the whole thing, I'm afraid. To the police and some of his friends, it was clear that Lucan had planned to murder his wife. But his son believes that it was just not possible. I do think my father was probably responsible in some way for her death. I, I certainly don't believe he struck the blows. I, I don't believe he asked anyone else to. And I don't even believe that the person who did strike the blows intended to or planned to. If you're a father and you've been through an unhappy sort of separation from your wife, the one thing you're moderately aware of is, is that, you know, um, two parents split up and they both want the kids, they start spoiling them. So the rather obvious thing is that um, the kids get to stay up late and watch telly. You've got a reasonable chance of guessing that your eldest daughter is going to be up at 9, 9.30. In fact, not only is she up, when the um, poor nanny has not returned, from the basement, it's, she actually offers to go downstairs to find out what's going on. So you're, you're meant to be Lord Lucan lurking in the basement with your lead piping. What are you going to say as you stand over the corpse of your children's nanny to your daughter of ten years' age? You might say my father was stupid. I'm, most people who knew him didn't. You might say he was extremely stressed, crazy, obsessed about his children. This is what the police argued. But if you're obsessed about your kids, this is precisely the thing you avoid inflicting upon. There's a sort of contradiction here in the police case. It argues on the one hand a frenzied, absurd attack, and on the other, cold, careful planning. It argues obsession about your children and then wanton disregard for their welfare. And I have trouble reconciling these two things. I don't believe that that is likely or even possible. As the murder of Sandra Ribbit was taking place on the night of November the 7th, 1974, a huge bomb exploded in a South London pub. Harold Wilson's Britain seemed to be in crisis. Union strikes, IRA explosions and rumors of communist uprisings unsettled the government. But the killing of Sandra Rivet in Belgravia, apparently by a peer of the realm, overtook all other stories in the headlines. A missing Earl was bigger news than an IRA bomb. As the media pressure mounted, the murder investigation intensified. In the weeks that followed, Billy Edgson was one of the 133 people police interviewed to build up a picture of Lucan's movements leading up to the night of the murder. I saw him that evening outside the Claremont Club. I told him at a quarter to nine he pulled up. And he, he called me over and asked, I think, he, I think he asked if Charles Benson or Greville Howard in the club. I said, no, my lord. I oh, said, thank you very much. And he drove off. Close friend Greville Howard admitted to the police that Lucan had told him his relationship with his wife had become so bad that it would be easier to kill her and dump her body in the sea. There was certainly an element of rumour amongst some members of the Claremont Club that he might do something, that he had been pre-planning this for some time, that he couldn't take it any longer and he was going to have to do something pretty serious. As one does say sometimes, you know, I, I really could, you know, I couldn't kill that, that person. Whoever's guilty of this crime, they prepared a kosh, so there's an element of preparation. Um, with that kosh, they intended to cause some serious injury, grievous bodily harm, so it's murder. There's intent there. But Lucan's son, George Bingham, believes that if the intruder had planned to murder, he would have chosen a more effective weapon. No one, given the choice of the weapon, ever planned to murder anyone. And let's just focus on the total inadequacy of this weapon. You've got a sort of seven or eight inch piece of lead piping. You have to say, are there alternative weapons that you could have used? Large glass ashtray, a vase, hammer, cricket bat, golf club. There's a 
awful lot of things in a normal person's own and you can bang someone over the head with and kill them instantly. You describe as a cosh as a piece of eight inch lead piping covered in bandage. It has neither the weight nor the tensile strength to crack a skull. In fact, in this instance, the killer, whoever they were, rained some sort of 15 odd blows or more, according to the police, on top of this young lady's head in a most horrible frenzied attack. But he didn't actually fracture her skull. And I think that's probably the most important thing. If you're going to rain down this weapon on somebody's head, and you've had two weeks to think about this, according to the police, you're going to produce quite a lot of blood. Not just blood on yourself, but blood on the walls, on the carpet, flecked everywhere. And you've got to, you've, you've got to ask yourself, what kind of a person is going to create so much blood and still try to hide a body, take it away in a sack? If you choose to think it's my father, what's he going to say to his children in the morning when they come down for breakfast? Former crime reporter Bob Strange, who worked closely with Chief Superintendent Roy Ransom for 20 years, believes that the original investigation could have been more thorough. Roy was completely happy with the investigation he undertook, but that is not to say that the investigation he undertook was necessarily a great investigation, because he also would freely admit that, that he knew from day one who the murderer was, so the going through the investigative procedure was just going through the motions. And he had a star witness in the form of Lady Lucan, who was lying in her hospital bed, dreadfully injured, but quite able to say to him, it was my husband what done it. And it's not surprising that uh, maybe along the way there may well have been stones that were left unturned. This program can reveal that the police failed to preserve the crime scenes at Lucan's flat and the murder house. We have discovered that the footprints in blood in the basement of 46 Lower Bell Grave Street were not of an intruder as originally suggested, but were made by a senior police officer. They were large footprints, so they were clearly from a man. There was some suggestion that they might have come from Lady Lucan, but it was quite clear that she was a petite little thing, and these were large footprints. We've also found that experts were unable to find a definitive fingerprint of Lucan at his flat. His flat was covered in hand marks made by police officers who should not have been there. It's been suggested that the, uh, the scene in Belgravia where Sandra Rivet was murdered wasn't particularly well handled. We have new standards today. We will freeze a scene. Um, we got new training, we're better at that, we understand much more. Um, forensics are much more sensitive now. We've got to judge it by the standards of 30 years ago. Um, DNA wasn't around 30 years ago, and I think it would be unfair to say that. If this new evidence about the footprints and the fingerprint had been disclosed at the time, it would have raised questions at the inquest about the thoroughness of the police investigation. The coroner's jury took only 30 minutes to come back with the verdict murder by Lord Lucan, but there were other legal problems surrounding the inquest. The inquest was a travesty. Lady Lucan gave evidence of the involvement of her husband in this murder, yet she couldn't be challenged. There could be no questions asked about a psychiatric history of which there was quite a lot of evidence. Nothing could be asked to really test her reliability as a witness. The coroner would not allow it. So if you accept what she said, then one can understand the jury's verdict. But her evidence was never tested. And I think if her evidence was tested, uh, the jury may have had uh, some doubts about it. It doesn't mean to say they wouldn't have found the same verdict, but I think they would definitely have had doubts about her evidence. So if there were doubts about the reliability of the main witness, could there have been an alternative scenario? Luke and Son believes there was. Best guess is he was doing some sort of insurance fraud. That's to say, you know, getting somebody to burgle his own house, make a claim. He hires a nondescript car. He gets hold of a likely lad, somebody who's going to do this for him while he um, ostensibly is sort of having dinner. He says to the lad, I'm going to give you these keys. You will let yourself in through the front door. Take this sack, fill the sack, take this piping, apply it to a, the window pane to the right of the door, so as it looks 
as if somebody has made a broken entry into the house. I've covered the piping in bandage in order to reduce the noise. Come up the stairs. Put the sack in the passenger seat of the car. I will give you an envelope full of notes. We never have to see each other again. That's, in my view, what probably was intended to have happened, but it was very clearly what didn't. Everything went horribly wrong. George Bingham believes that when the burglar was disturbed by Sandra Rivet, he lost complete control and lashed out in a blind panic at her and then Lady Lucan. Having waited for some time outside the house, Lucan then went inside to investigate. At some point, I think just then, my father finally gives up waiting, tapping his hands in the dashboard of the car and gets out the car and comes in the door. What's happened here? This is amazing. My mother, of course, she's just suffered the most tremendous and ferocious attack. She's in massive shock. She's probably concussed. And she's also, by her own admission, on some very, very uh, heavy-duty prescription medicines in those days. But she's coming to in all this darkness after this assault. And what she see? She sees the husband of 12 years who deserted her a year and a half beforehand and has been going through the courts trying to take her children away from her. What would you think if you were her? And then they spend some 40-odd minutes together. Wonder to this day, I'm sure, what people do, what on earth they were saying to each other. But at some point, uh, she takes advantage of you know, his momentary absence from the room and legs it down the stairs off to the pub to raise the alarm. But I do understand why she might easily, in that situation, have been convinced. I think I would probably have thought it for a while. What did happen to Lucan after he abandoned his friend's car at New Haven? Could he have committed suicide? Or did he escape to live a secret life abroad? Hundreds of people around the world claim to have seen him in various guises, as a policeman, a waiter in Greece, and living as a hippie in Goa. In part four, we look at one amazing story that turned out to be a great media hoax. Officially, Lord Lucan has never been seen since the night of the murder. After the visit to Susan Maxwell Scott in Uckfield and the discovery of his car in New Haven, the trail went cold. With no solid proof as to whether Lucan was alive or dead, police began a four-day search around the south coast. So what did happen to Lucan? Many people continue to speculate on whether he committed suicide or escape to a new life abroad. If he committed suicide, did he jump off the cliffs at New Haven? If Lord Lucan jumped off New Haven cliffs, he would die. There's seven or eight points along this coast where he could quite easily decide to jump off and he would get the job done, definitely. It's an awful long way to fall and it's falling on solid rock and it's almost 100% successful. I'm absolutely convinced he definitely could have committed suicide and never been found. Definitely. It's been a less he might have jumped off a ferry. If you fall in the sea in November in ordinary civilian clothes, it is freezing. Your arms stop working almost straight away. Survival time, a couple of hours, absolute tops. If you, you jump into the propellers of a ferry, no one will find anything of you ever again in just, just bits. If he deliberately jumped off any sort of boat, um, the chances of finding him would have been probably less than 50%. If he didn't commit suicide, could he have escaped and who would have helped him? Locally, it seemed very extraordinary that they wouldn't concentrate on, on what is obvious to people within the marina, that there was a possibility that he had a contact here and that he actually drove down specifically for that reason. A thorough investigation of the boats wasn't actually carried out by the police. Um, so if he was actually on board, he went undetected. Lucan was well connected, and many friends admit they would have helped him if he had asked. If he'd turned up on my doorstep, one would have been very tempted to help him lie doggo. For many years, we just imagined he was round the corner somewhere. He'd be more than happy. Even if he walked in today, I'd say there's a bed up there. You know, I mean, he wouldn't... I don't know, I suppose he was a friend and remains a friend, even if he's not here. 
the very meaning and essence of friendship is to help a man when he's in exactly a position like that. And therefore, he can call on me. Anybody can who's in that close group. And for them, you will take any risk, face any penalty. Over 30 years, people across the world are still spotting Lord Lucan, walking along streets and drinking in bars. The police inquiries have centered on the Grand Hotel in a back street. Oh, close to met Sherbrooke. a man called Barry Halpin in Goa and was convinced he was the missing Lord. Yes. So the meal is Lord Lucan. Runaway government minister John Stonehouse was mistaken for Lucan and arrested in Australia to be brought home in disgrace. There have been numerous sightings in South America and even more in Southern Africa and the Seychelles. Last year, a whole book was written claiming the missing Earl had lived as a hippie in Goa, known as Jungly Barry, before it was discovered that the man was a former Lancashire teacher. The bizarre uh, sightings are such that you would look at the aged picture of a person they suggest is Lord Lucan, and it's obviously not him. Uh, you know, we've got his height, there's certain things he cannot change. Close, um, you can't say they're close, because there's still sightings coming in. Uh, and there are lines we're following up today. The regular sightings and continuing mystery spawned a Lucan industry. T-shirts and books, a gift to brazen con men like John Miller, the same man who kidnapped Ronnie Biggs, the fugitive train robber. He took ITN on a wild goose chase around the Caribbean after claiming he'd found Lucan in Cuba. The alleged plan was to stage a meeting under the cover of darkness between Lucan and a TV news crew waiting to capture pictures of him for the world press. And I would emerge from the darkness, walk towards them, our boat's spotlight would go on, and there would be Lord Lucan for the world to see. The boat arrived at 20 past midnight, and I went forward, but then everything went wrong. These gunshots were part of what turned out to be an elaborate hoax. No, if it had been a hoax, we would have, we would have made it a, a much more convincing hoax than that. Until the case is closed, people will continue to speculate as to Lucan's whereabouts. Journalist Chester Stern has travelled the world more than anyone searching for Lucan. He may not be alive now, but I'm pretty convinced that he was alive for some time after, after the event probably living somewhere in Africa, possibly in a German area, maybe with a German woman, because he was fluent in German. That's my theory. I, I, I think that's probably what, what happened to him. I believe that he got away that night and that he was helped to get out of the country and that he has lived ever since abroad and that he has been watching developments, watching the theories, enjoying the programs, enjoying the books, and allowing and reveling in the mystery that he has created. My intuition as his son is that he died within about 12 hours of, of the event. My intuition as his son is he didn't even get out of London. But, and that raises a whole load of questions which I don't know where to go with, that's just an intuition. I genuinely think everyone thought he would come back until about June of 1975, and then I think one by one they began to realize that he, would, he was not going to be able to, or had chosen not to. That's, that's my own, my best guess. It may be that there just isn't much in London that, that merits him coming back to. His so-called friends aren't really his friends. His family have grown up without him and are now a, a distant memory for him. And whatever he has done and wherever he is in the world, it presumably has gone pretty well for him because he hasn't come back to reclaim the life that he did have. After decades of having to contend with idle rumor and speculation, there may at last be closure for the Rivet and Lucan families. Scotland Yard have now decided to hold a full-scale review of the Lucan file, bringing in new scientific techniques to re-examine the evidence. What we're doing right now is we're putting that to a murder review team with new standards. It's an opportunity for him to come forward and clear his name. Uh, I think it's important for justice. I think it's important for Sandra Rivett and her family. I think it's important for the Lucan family. And I think it's important for police as well, because there would also be those people out there that say that we didn't put the effort in. But 
every single homicide, every single murder, relentless pursuit. We will do our job to the bitter end. We can reveal that police found a fingerprint on the murder weapon, but at the time did not have the expertise to lift it from the elastoplast or wrapped around the lead piping. Today, with new technology, including DNA testing, the new investigation may determine whether the fingerprint belonged to Lucan or to someone else. I suspect that the, the original investigation into this matter fell well short of what a reasonable general public might expect of the police. And I think on that basis alone, uh, the case merits a further investigation. The police actually improperly investigated it, in my opinion, and I could allude to the absence of my father's fingerprints or blood group or even, you know, the most elementary investigative procedures you'd expect of, of a decent police force. So I would definitely welcome a new investigation. If it turned out with some new fancy techniques that my father was definitely guilty, you know, you've got to accept the judgment. Um, I certainly grew up most of my youth believing that he was responsible. I think it would be extremely unlikely. But, you know, your logic can be wrong sometimes. And I may be wrong about this. Six years after the murder, the trauma of that evening was still evident on Lady Lucan. Twenty years on, she still lives in Belgravia, a recluse estranged from her children. It might have been better for our family had he succeeded in killing me. And provided it, it didn't hurt, and if it were better for our family that this should have happened, then uh, I sometimes think uh, I wouldn't know anything about it. And our family would have continued without all this publicity. For Sandra Rivett's family and friends, they have to live with the memory of her death. Her close friend remembers her. The afternoon prior to her being killed, when she came into our house, and um, so full of joy, so full of expectation, so full of life, just absolutely radiant with it, and she was stepping into this big adventure. Somebody lost a mother there. And I, my sisters, lost a father. Um, you know, and lots of people lost a friend on either side. So this is bad. People sometimes ask me, "Why, George, you never look at this before?" And uh, the answer is, "Well, you know, I don't really want to have to live out my parents' life forever and, not, and their, you know, their misfortunes or whatever." When I was 27, I tried to look at it. It sent me a little bit crazy. I was struggling to incorporate something which my mind would not accept. You're tearing yourself apart because your logic simply cannot accept this. And yet, it seems to be so much the accepted version of events. Um, I must say that made me very, very depressed and unhappy for, for a year or two. But uh, after a while, you, just, you can see that perhaps, you can see perhaps how other people came to that point of view, and then it's, though it's still illogical, it's still extremely improbable, it is at least explicable, the situation that everyone finds himself in, believing in this, this rather peculiar story. <laughs> Be honest. With Scotland Yard's computer-aged image of what Lucan may look like today and the latest DNA and forensic techniques, police hope the new inquiry will discover information that could finally close the file for the families of Sandra Rivett and Lord Lucan.